Um, Ambassador Amina Mohammed, uh, Minister for Education, uh, Senator James Agrirengo, um, the Cabinet uh, Assistant Secretary for Labor, uh, Honorable Abdul Bahari, uh, um, the General Secretary of OATU, Comrade Arezki Mezhud, Director of ILO East Africa, Brother Wellington Chibebe, the Secretary General of COTU, Ndugu Francis Atuli, all protocols have served, ladies and gentlemen. Good morning. Good morning. I can see we have got several guests who have come from different parts of the continent to be with us here. Uh, this morning in Kenya we say Hamjambo. Yeah. Welcome to Kenya today. Uh, it is a great pleasure to be at this conference uh, this morning. It comes at a critical moment in our country with regard to our economy, politics, and our grand vision for the future. The situation is more or less the same for Africa and the entire globe. It is a time of significant changes in Africa and across the world, and a period of uncertainty, especially for workers, job seekers, leaders, and employers all at once. Because as you know, we are in the midst of uh, the fourth industrial revolution. So you see, now workers are competing with machines. You've got robots who are also looking for jobs. <laughs> okay. So whether they are talking of the wall and tariffs in the USA, migration laws in Europe, or Brexit in the UK, the common denominator is the future of work and the future of workers. It's the same story when we in Africa talk of the vision 2063 of greater connectivity via infrastructure, single African air transport market, the African continental free trade area, it is about the future of work and workers, of trade and traders, and their investments. At the moment, you see, it's still very difficult to travel across Africa. You come from here, you have to go via another place before you can reach Nairobi. And you pay a lot of money to do so. Mainly because most of our African countries have refused to ratify what we call the um, um, uh, free, uh, free uh, air or open skies uh, agreement, which was uh, conceived in, in 1988 to now. Uh, across the world, and in Africa in particular, we are struggling with how to ensure full employment for our people, how to provide quality education for our children, security and equality of opportunity for all citizens, regardless of their race, their origin or tribe. Whether you have come from uh, this meeting, wherever we have come from, I believe that one of the most pressing issues we face in our countries is work, how to provide well-paying and sustainable jobs for our people, especially our youth. And Africa is a very young continent, youthful, because uh, they say that about 70% uh, of our population is below the age of 35. And jobs are not about welfare of individuals. Jobs affirm the soundness of the economy. Availability of jobs ensures security, dignity, and better pay for workers. This means job creation should be a concern uh, 
to the worker, the employer, the management, and most important, to the trade unionists fighting for the welfare of workers. As a country, we have always believed in strong and responsible trade union movement. And trade union movement did play a very pioneer role during the struggle for independence in our country in those days. We find that a number of our trade union leaders were in colonial detention at that time. People like Makan Singh, like um, uh, Fred Kubai, and so on. Even at our lowest moments, we have always embraced the idea that workers need protection and so they need strong unions to protect and represent their interests. We believe in trade unions that use their power to think not just about today's pay and working conditions, but also how to ensure we create a vibrant economy that creates more jobs for more jobless. In other words, not just to protect those who are in employment, but to ensure that other people who are unemployed also get jobs. We must admit that even as we champion interests of those already in employment, there are millions of our citizens who are out of work and are praying that we can create a good environment for more firms to set up here and take in more people. In this regard, I hold the view that workers are better served when they, through their unions, build genuine trust and understanding with employers, and when there is genuine trust between management and trade union officials, including shop stewards. What this means is that management and unions need to stop regarding each other with suspicion. It means management Unions and employers need to stop viewing each other as adversaries and instead regard each other as partners in a joint venture. I know this is easier said than done. I know many workers are making do with the deplorable working conditions without even basic protections just because employers feel there's a glut of job seekers willing to take up work are the most miserable conditions. I also know there are employers struggling with the near impossible demands of workers who feel they deserve better, better because of their level of education and service to society. The answer lies in a collaborative approach that makes workers, employers, and managers view each other as partners in a joint venture. This approach serves the interests of all. It means pupils remain in school with their teachers, patients are attended to by their doctors, factories keep running while the, uh, the, the workers, including teachers, doctors, and all others get what is seen and agreed to a, a fair deal that also allows the employers the space to provide the desired services, expand to absorb more people, while also making some profit for those that need to do so. The fact is that our countries have suffered too much and too long for, from employers, management and unions regarding each other with suspicion and as enemies. Unions and employers have behaved as adversaries rather than as partners in a joint venture. We need to encourage greater participation and involvement of employees before management takes decisions. Employees need to know about proposed changes and the introduction of new measures that may affect their future. They need to know this in good time so they can have a chance to express their views and weigh their options. The input by workers' experience 
may actually enable organizations and firms to foresee things which had escaped the notice of management. Where recognized trade unions exist, they must be allowed to use their machinery for negotiations and consultations with employers and ensure that their views are considered alongside others. The right to participate should be available to all employees, whether they are trade unionists or not. But this does not mean management and employers should not make decisions. In the balance of power between workers and employers, none should hold the other at ransom. None should take advantage of the other. All should be guided by the idea that partnership and cooperation are essential for economic uh, uh, for, so, sorry, um, uh, are essential for economic recovery, and economic recovery is vital for better working conditions. Workers, unions, and employers must therefore change attitudes. Dismissing laborers and withholding of labor or strikes must therefore be tools of last resort. And you say it so, that strikes is always there as a weapon, but it must be a weapon of last resort. It's like a bullet in a gun. It is only becomes, it remains a weapon when it is still in the gun. When it has been shot, it's no longer a weapon. The need for cooperation and dialogue needs to be inculcated at all levels of both government and private sector. Government should not have any difficulty in working with trade unions. And unions should have no problem negotiating with the government in an environment devoid of victor and loser mindsets. The economic problems of the nation need to be mastered by both workers or their unions and employers alike. Uh, The labor movement in Kenya knows that the Kenyan worker were the main beneficiaries of what we did sometimes last year. I am glad that this conference is dedicated to the education of the workers. This is an important area for possible collaboration between unions and governments. It is important for African governments consider funding education programs for workers because a better skilled and knowledgeable workforce is more productive and better place to engage on issues of industrial relations, including strike actions. In Kenya, the labor movement has called on the government to consider supporting workers' education through funding of Tom Boyer Labor College. I support this call. I am aware that the government has previously sub supported the college by financing a resource center. But the second phase of that project stalled due to lack of funds. I will stand with the labor movement in lobbying for support. In the end, it boils down to how workers, employers, and government relate. This has impact on economy, which in turn has impact on the welfare of the workers. We must always have this in mind. I believe the great majority of trade union leaders are reasonable people who know the economic conditions in their countries. And I agree here with what the Secretary General said about the conditions in our country today. If you read the newspapers almost on a daily basis, 
It's like we're living in a, a country somewhere in the space, out of space. Mega scandals after the other. Money being paid for projects that are not implemented. Money transferred from a bank account in Kenya to Italy, to London, and back to Kenya. And this money is going into account of certain people. These are criminals. If they were in China, they would be living in another world today. So we must reach a stage where we must take radical actions to deal with this cancer of corruption in our country. Otherwise, we will not have a country tomorrow. We, and what is happening in Kenya, is not unique to Kenya. It is also happening in other African countries. Africa must wake up and become of age. We still, many African countries are playing in super league of corruption. And this is where we must move Africa from. Because Africa has got a great potential. Here I'm talking as a Pan-Africanist and an Afro-optimist who believes in the ability of the African people to develop Africa. But this will only happen if we stand up as one people and fight against the vices which are making it difficult for Africa to realize its great potential. Africa is the greatest, is the richest continent on earth in terms of resources. Yes, the paradox is the richest continent is also the poorest in terms of living conditions of our people. And we must stop continuing to blame our colonial past. That's long ago. Korea was also a colony. Even Singapore was a colony. Malaysia was a colony. India was a colony. So we, we must come of age and develop our continent. I have been given a challenge by the African Union to be in charge of infrastructure development of our continent. But I'm hoping that I'm going to get support in this task, not only from the government, but also from the unions in the continent. We want to ensure that Africa is connected by infrastructure. The Great North Road from Cape to Cairo, from Tunisia, Tunis to the Cape, from, da from Dakar to Djibouti, from uh, Lagos to Mombasa, Dakar to Lagos, and the Trans-African Railway Line from Lamu to uh, Douala, Cameroon to open up the continent, a land bridge between the uh, Atlantic and the Indian Ocean, and open up the interior of the continent, which are all landlocked. Then we will be able to make the, the African free trade area a reality, intra-African trade. Intra-African trade will grow. And energy, and the fiber optic network, so that we can be able to communicate easily in the continent. And then open up the skies of the continent. Europe has got open skies. One European air control. You're flying from Rome to Ireland, one air control. And that's why the, the rates, the, the, the fares are very cheap in Europe. But in Africa, you want to fly from here to, to Lagos? If you are going on a private airplane, you must get a clearance from Ugandan air traffic control, from DRC Congo, from Congo Brazzaville, from Central African Republic, from Cameroon, before you reach Lagos. This is Stone Age. And this you must change. Let's look at each other as one people. This is how we can be able to develop the continent of Africa. I thank you. And with those remarks now, it is my pleasure.
to declare the Pan-African Trade Union Symposium on the importance of quality education officially opened.